Coming up today is another important accounting standard, SLFR is 15. And this is one of the heaviest standard in our curriculum. I will tell you why. And this standard was developed by abolishing couple of previous standards and couple of IFRIX and SIX. As you can see for yourself, the standards that we had for revenue recognition before the standard being effective was LKS 18 revenue that has been completely abolished now. In addition to LKS 18, we also had LKS 11 construction contracts even that has been abolished. And then we had FRIC 13 customer loyalty programs, it has been abolished. And we had FRIC 18 transfer of assets from customers, that also has been abolished. We had IFRIC 15 agreements for the construction of real estate, even that has been abolished. Also, there was SIC 31 revenue barter transactions involving advertising services, they all have been abolished and they are no longer available. It is not that those standards were dead and buried underneath the ground. All those IFRIC 6 and L cases were taken together to develop SLFR is 15. So, then if you had all these before, we had, we have just one item of standard now, we are all the contents of the previous LKs 18, LKs 11, IFRIC 13, IFRIC 18, IFRIC 15, SIC 31 have been amalgamated, merged together into a single standard. That is because I wanted you to understand how heavy this is, how bulky this is and that takes a long time. If you do a thorough comprehensive job, it will take a longer time. Now, coming straight to our discussion of SLFR is 15. This standard introduces a new model for revenue recognition. That is <coughs> recognizing revenue from the contracts of the uh, with the customers and they introduce a model called five step model. Obviously, in five step model there should be five step. Now, the name given for the standard is the revenue recognition SLFR is 15 revenue recognition from the contracts with the customers. So, there is an important term to be highlighted contract. As much as this concept was important in financial instrument, this is equally important in revenue recognition as well. So, where there is no contract, you need not to apply SLFR is 50. So, where there is a contract, then we should apply SLFR is 50. And this contract need not to be in writing always. The contract sometimes can be in form of a legal document in black and white. The contract sometimes can be in form of words spoken, does not matter. Sometimes the contract can be also in form of implied terms and conditions. Now, say for a small example, if you walk into a restaurant to have your meal, the steward will come and take your meal after going through the recipe, uh, the menu card, sorry, the menu card. And uh, the steward will take the, uh, the order and the steward will never get you to sign a contract confirming that you will pay after having the meal. Neither will you ever get the steward to sign a contract confirming that he will serve us after making the payment. But we know that he will serve us the meal and we are under the obligation to pay him after receiving the meal. So, that is kind of a mutual understanding and even that can become a contract. So, the contract is the must that is the uh, 
the, the core requirement in this discussion of SLFR is 15 and the contract can be in form of a le uh, document that's, that can be in, uh, in writing or it can be by words, words spoken, it can be by mutual understanding also. And let us come to the 5 step model straight. However much it is complicated, whatever kind of revenue you will uh, recognize irrespective of their nature, you need to apply this 5 step model. The first one says identification of the contract, second one identifying the performance obligations in the contract, third determining the contract price or transaction price. Fourth, allocation of the transaction price to the performance obligations. Fifth one, recognize revenue when the entity satisfies a performance obligation. Now, let us start with identifying the contract with the customer. Now, for the first criteria to be completed, Again, you need to look at uh, five criteria and all the five are required. If at least one requirement is not satisfied, there is no contract. In the absence of a contract, SLFR is 15 does not apply. What if all four will be satisfied and one is not, is not satisfied? still there is no contract and SLFR is 15 does not apply. So, let me take one by one and as many examples as you need can be provided, but within the time constraint all the examples can be cannot be given. I, I will try to give you at least one example for each criteria. Parties have approved the contract and are committed to perform. <coughs> Now, this is not about revenue recognition, this is the first criteria which is identifying the contract. Even to identify the contract, you need to look at five criteria. Parties have approved the contract and are committed to perform. <coughs> Say APLC is a seller, BPLC has been a customer, BPLC places an order with the seller, B is sending them a purchase order requesting 10 computers to be delivered in 2 weeks time from the date of the purchase order and A is ordinary business activities is buying and selling computers, importing and selling computers. Purchase order date has been say 1st January 19, right. Sending a purchase order is like you entering into a contract, but for this contract to be binding and valid or to make a long story short for there to be a contract, the other party should approve the contract. Now, the supplier what happens is without sending any feedback, without responding to the purchase order, the supplier appears just keeps it filed and A does not even give a ring cut to the buyer to the customer saying that we got the purchase order, A the supplier is keeping absolutely silent and quiet. Then has this contract been approved by the relevant parties concerned? A has not approved. So, without A approving the contract, Without A approving the purchase order, it is like A not approving the purchase order is not like A and B having A, uh, A not approving the contract purchase order is like A and B not having a contract binding and valid contract. So, then in the absence of a contract, no SLFR is 15, does not apply. But to the contrary, say B has sent the purchase order on 1st January 19 and as soon as A collected the purchase order started 
ringing B and says, look here, we got the purchase order and we have gone through the contents and we are okay with that and we will ensure that you will get the computers, 10 computers as requested by you in two weeks time. Now, A, sending a feedback to the customer is like the parties to the contract concern are approving the contract. So, now only the first requirement is satisfied in the contract. Second, each party's rights are identifiable. Each party's rights are identifiable. There are two parties A and B. A is an educational institution. B is the customer. And A is offering, say, degree programs. At the commencement of each deg degree program, what happens is, A is charging 20,000 rupees admission fees. Apart from charging the admission fees, there will be the course fees of 1.5 million rupees and that is a separate charge. Now, at the enrollment, the customer without paying the total cost fees of 1.5 million rupees paid only admission fees. Having paid only the admission fees, the customer gets the enrollment and then the customer walks into the lecture hall to get the service and the customer is asking the required materials. The customer is complaining for not the lectures being of a qualitative nature and the customer complains of uh, not providing the materials as requested. Now, for there to be a contract, each party's rights are identifiable. Now, look at it very carefully. Just by paying this 20,000 admission fees, has the customer earned the right of receiving the service of education? No. And just by receiving 20,000 rupees, has the service provider earned the right of receiving the cost fee of 1.5 million rupees? Not. So, as a result, just by paying 20,000 rupees admission fees, each party's rights are not identifiable. The rights of receiving the cost fee and the rights of receiving the service of education have not been established, have not been identifiable. Then say, the customer in addition to paying the 20,000 uh, admission fees at the enrollment has also paid the full course fees, 1.5 million. Now, the customer's right of receiving the service are identifiable and established. And the customer says, let me pay the admission fees of 20,000 rupees right now and to pay the full amount of course fees just in one month's time. And the service provider agreed. And by entering into that mutual understanding of paying 1.5 million rupees course fees in one month's time, the service provider has understood his right of receiving 1.5 million rupees course fees in one month's time and the customer identified his right of receiving the service over whatever the tenure of the entire course. Now, the rights are identified. Just another simple example. Say, company A is a hospital. Company A is a hospital 
and company B has been a customer, a patient. Now, customer is admitted himself to the hospital. At the admission, there will be an admission charge of 10,000 rupees just for the simple fact of opening up a file and putting a small A4 sheet inside. The customer paid only the admission fees and nothing else. And just by paying the admission fees, the customer does not get the right of receiving the treatment. The rights are not identifiable. Just by receiving 10,000 rupees admission fees at the point of the admission, the service provider has not earned the right of receiving the value of the services to be provided. Now, as a result, for there to be a contract, there has to be uh, the second criteria to be satisfied. Each party's rights are identifiable. If the customer pays, I do not mind paying 10,000 admission fees on my own, but I have got myself insured and my insurance company will come and settle you, then the rights are identifiable. The hospital knows that their fees will be settled by an outside party and the customer knows at the cost of an outside party he can get the service from the service provider. Next one, each party's payment terms are identifiable. Payment terms are identifiable, how the payments are made and when the payments are made payment terms are identifiable, how and when the payments are made. So, let me give you a simple example for that as well. Now, in front of a hospital was a man who was crossing the road and this man was little absent minded like he was crossing the road while answering to the phone. And he did not notice the speeding tri show guy and when he was crossing the road he was uh, knocked down by the speeding tri show guy right on the middle of the road. And he fell on the middle of the road unconscious and this man started bleeding. A passing by pedestrian noticed a man lying on the middle of the road bleeding and since it happened in front of the hospital, a private hospital, this patient was taken to the nearby hospital by this passing by pedestrian. Right at the time of the admission of the pedestrian or the patient, he was unconscious and as per the existing law in a particular country, it may not be Sri Lanka, that anyone whether it is private or government cannot deny providing the treatment to a patient if the patient was unconscious at the time of the admission. The hospital took him to the <coughs> operating theatre, still this man was unconscious and the hospital has given the required immediate treatments and the value of the treatments given to the patient is 1.5 million rupees. And before the treatments were given, before the surgery was started, the hospital cannot this patient, uh, cannot wake this patient up to ask how the hell are you going to pay us after receiving the service? By the time the treatments were provided, the patient was unconscious and he himself cannot say how he is going to pay, when he is going to pay after receiving the treatments. So, here now each part is, I mean the, the payment terms are not identifiable and the hospital does not know how he 
how the hospital will get the payment and when the hospital will get the payment. Similarly, the patient does not know when he can make the payment and when how he will make the payment to the hospital. So, then no contract, where there is no contract, SLFRS 15 does not apply. Contract has a commercial substance. <coughs> Now, let me explain the concept of commercial substance and to relate it to our discussion of SLFRS 50. So, there are two assets A and B. This entity is going to exchange asset A with asset B. Asset A will be sold and the settlement of the consideration of asset A will be the receipt of asset B. Now, we learn this concepts in LK 40, LK 16 as well. For you to recognize any profit or loss on this exchange, for you to de-recognize asset A and to recognize asset B, there should be a commercial substance. This particular transaction of the entity transferring asset A and receiving asset B has to create some change in the cash flows of the entity. And if this transaction of asset A being given and asset B being received does not make any change of the future cash flows of the entity, then this transaction does not have a commercial substance. Say asset A has remaining 3 years lifetime. And so does asset B, 3 years lifetime. Expected cash flow from asset A for a year is 5 million rupees. 5 million, 5 million. And so is asset B. Expected cash flow for a year is 5 million rupees. Now, whether you keep asset a or whether you keep asset B makes a difference, any difference in the future cash flows of the entity or does not make any difference in the cash flows of the entity whatsoever, does not make any difference whatsoever. You decide to keep asset A without exchanging it with B and that will create only 15 million cash flows over the rest of the lifetime. The entity will decide to transfer asset A and to receive asset B. Instead, even that will create only 15 million. So, then this exchange transaction is absolutely useless. It is not worth being done because whether you keep asset A or whether you keep asset B, there can be just a difference in the physical look of the asset, physical nature of the asset. One asset can, can be massive and the asset, other asset can be small. One asset may look beautiful, the other asset will look ugly. There can be physical, I mean differences in the physical nature, physical look, but that is not what we are concerned about, what are we bothered, what are we concerned about, whether this exchange transaction can create a difference in the future cash flows of the end. It does not create any difference in the future cash flows. So, you have one particular lecture for a particular subject and he takes a 100 hours to complete one particular module and he is going to be replaced with another lecturer. Both lecturers will have the same voice, same tone, same efficiency, same story, same contents, same durations. And will you bother about the physical look of the lecturer? No. 
what matters is not how the lecturers physically look, what matters whether their presentations are effective or not. And then replacement is utter, utterly useless, no point. Similarly here, you giving asset A and receiving asset B does not have a substance commercially, why that does not make any difference whatsoever in the future cash flows of the entity. So, this particular transaction does not have a commercial substance. How do you check it, verify it correctly to check the commercial substance of the transaction? You need to check the cash flows of the asset to be transferred with the cash flows of the asset to be received in three different configurations. What are these three different configurations? Timing, amounts and the risks A and B. Timings are 3 years, amounts are 15 million, risks are assumed to be the same. Just imagine A having remaining 3 years and B having 5 years cash flows. And A will generate 15 million cash flows over 3 years time. B also will generate 15 million cash flows, but it will take altogether 5 years. Amounts of the cash flows are equal 15 million rupees each. But the timings are equal or timings are not equal. Timings are not equal. A takes only 3 years, but B will take 5 years altogether. The faster and the quicker you can generate cash flows, the lower the risk is. The slower the cash flows are generated, the higher the risk should be. So, as a result, when the timings are different, also the risk factor can be different. So, we will bring that concepts here to SLFR is 15. If You enter into a contract, maybe for a construction of a building and if that contract does not create any differences in the future cash flows of the entity, it is like the entity not entering into a contract and there is no contract. So, for there to be a contract, there has to be a commercial substance. What does it mean? The contract that you enter into in the entity has to create some difference in the cash flows or rather in the future. Then, it is probable the entity will collect the consideration it is entitled to in exchange for the transfer of good services to the customer. Let us take another simple example to explain that. Company A is in the real estate and they have a building for sale at 10 million rupees and this is within the urban area, crowded area. B has been a customer and A is offering to the customers different payment patterns. If the customer prefers to make the payment at once, that is available. And if the customer wants the supply himself to arrange them a finance facility even that is available. And if the customer cannot afford to make the full payment right now, they can just pay 10 percent of the total value right now and take the physical possession and then they can keep on paying the balance part 90 percent in bits and pieces over a prolonged period. Different payment patterns are available. B has been a customer, person who has been working abroad for many years 
also in construction industry. He has the experience in the construction industry. And he comes to buy this building for him to start running a restaurant to provide mouth watering meals to the customers. And B will explain, look I do not mind paying you 10 percent of the total value that is 1 million rupees and let me pay the balance 90 percent 9 million rupees over 10 years time let me pay monthly and I am going to pay you the balance amount of 90 percent from the income I generate by running the restaurant. Now, if there is a contract, you can apply SLFRS 15. Where you apply SLFRS 15, you can recognize revenue as per in accordance with SLFRS 15. So, before everything else, you must see whether there is a contract. For there to be a contract, all these five criteria need to be satisfied simultaneously. Now, the last criteria which we are discussing right now is that the entity should make an assessment of the ability of recovering the total consideration. And if everything is satisfied, the entity can bring 10 million rupees into revenue. 1 million can be debited to cash account, the 9 million balance receivable can be debited to receivable debtors account, forget about the interest. For this to be done, for this to be taken to the revenue account, there has to be a contract, for the contract to exist all this why you need to be there. Now, this entity, the real estate company, the seller, takes two facts into account. Is there a possibility of recovering the balance 90 percent from the customer? For him to be able to pay the balance 90 percent, he should be able to earn income enough adequately to pay. For him to generate the revenue, his business should be successful. For his business to be successful, he should be an experienced and expertise in the particular area. And you know running restaurant is not so hard. We have seen restaurants mushrooming almost everywhere in the city. But no one is doing an exceptional or at least a perfect job. And for you to be different from the others, you have to do something different. For you to make yourself exceptional from the others, you need to do something exceptional. And this man in this particular industry cannot do anything exceptional, why he does not have the required skills, talented and the required experience to survive let alone be an exceptional, even to survive in the industry, he does not have the required skill. And also we know this is to be run in the urban crowded area, where there are enough and plenty restaurants being run. So, by taking all these facts into account, the entity, the seller is quite skeptic, skeptic whether they can recover the full amount or not. They have a significant uncertainty whether they can collect the balance 90 percent or not. It is not pretty sure, it is not certain, there is no probability of being able to collect the balance 90 percent, then it is like the seller and the customer not entering into a contract to sell the property. It is like seller receiving 1 million rupee loan from someone to be refunded. So, without bringing this entire 10 million rupees into revenue and recognizing the amount collected 1 million rupees to cash and bringing the balance 9 million rupees to de debtors account, 
since there is no probability of being able to collect the balance 90 percent the seller brings 1 million rupees into a liability account the payable account why since there is no probability being able to collect the balance amount it's like a contract not existing so where there is no contract revenue cannot be recognized so that is the first step in our five step model what is it identifying the contract so we will move on to the second step now what is the second step identifying the performance obligation <coughs> and that is the most important step there can be lot of confusions unless you concentrate to the point and if somebody does a self study that is where most of them are likely have been stuck at i'll tell you the reason what do you mean by a performance obligation in simple language which you i, un I understand performance obligation in simplest available language which we will we'll give it an interpretation performance obligation is an enforceable promise enforceable promise and if you are not interested in even you can remove this adverb enforce or adjective enforceable promise it is a promise so if somebody wants you to explain the concept of performance obligation the simplest available example a simplest available explanation that you can think at the spur of the moment should be what a promise and that is what has to be at the tip of your tongue and you need to keep it at the at, at the back of your mind always remember this is the simplest explanation as to what a performance obligation should be <coughs> now what promise are you receiving a consideration from the customer for what do you promise to deliver for the consideration you are receiving from the customer what do you promise to deliver which goods or services are you promising to deliver in exchange of the consideration we are receiving from the customer and that is how you elaborate it a bit what promise or what goods and services do you promise to deliver in exchange of the consideration from the customer remember before you recognize revenue you need to first and foremost identify the performance obligation that is done being on a concept what is the concept please you need to remember this this distinctiveness distinctiveness this is the concept to be remembered perfect it has to be solid and you need to remember it forever if you forget it you will forget what performance obligation concept also and you need to write it in your mind indelibly that performance obligations are 
enforceable promise how do we recognize how do we identify promises based on a concept called distinctiveness now <clears throat> in simple terms to explain this distinctiveness now remember before that what you think is distinctive may not be distinctive in our explanation say an entity enters into a contract to sell a mobile at 300000 rupees at the same time in the same contract the seller offers free services over 12 months period So, what did I explain the performance obligations were? Enforceable promises. How did I further elaborate it? What goods and services does the seller promise for the consideration received or to, to be received? Now, the seller promises a mobile phone plus free services over 12 months period for a consideration of 300,000 and for that 300,000 how many performance obligations are there? How many enforceable promises are there? To identify that you need to look at distinctiveness. Distinctiveness never mean physical distinctiveness, physical appearance, physical differences, no. So, that is where the problems, that is where most of the students will get stuck at. The way you check and evaluate the distinctiveness will be a bit of a lengthy process which I will explain right now and remember if you feel that Receiving 300,000 rupees is just to give only the mobile, there is only one performance obligation. And if you feel that the seller is receiving 300,000 rupees for two promises of selling a mobile and providing service, providing services over a year's time and there are two performance obligations. How do we break that into two or how do we consider, how do we uh, get to know that there is only one enforceable promise that is purely based on this concept of distinctiveness. Let us look at the concept of distinctiveness. I want you to learn it perfect and if you mess that up, the rest of the standard will be messed up. <coughs> So, you should learn and you should follow only what I want you to follow and you cannot have your own criteria. If you have your own criteria that will be mixed with my explanations and it is going to be a hell of a disaster. Right. Now, we will apply two methods. Let me take the first method where there are two steps. Right. And you need to follow both steps at the same time, but I cannot explain both of them at once. So, let me explain step by step. So, there are two methods. I am explaining the first method still. There are two steps in the first method. So, for you to arrive at the final conclusion, you need to apply both steps together. But in my explanations, I won't apply or both steps at once. Let me go one by one. Right. Step one: focus on whether the goods or service is capable of being distinct. How do we 
check whether the goods or services are distinct from each other, you need to question yourself. The first question to raise from yourself, can the customer benefit from the individual goods or services on its own? Let me take the same example. Seller is A. Seller is receiving 300,000 rupees and this is to provide a mobile along with free services over 12 months. If there is only one particular performance obligation, you bring this entire 300,000 rupees as one item of revenue. And if you feel that there are two performance obligations, you need to divide and split this 300,000 between two items of performance obligations, meaning you need to identify two items of revenue in your profit and loss. First step. Question 1. Can the customer benefit from the individual goods or services on its own? Now, is there a way of the customer, is there a way for the customer of receiving the mobile from this seller and to receive the services from another supplier, another seller, another service provider? If I further simplify that, is there a way possible for the customer of receiving the mobile from A and to receive the SIM card from another party? Do we have a market as such? So, you need to see whether a market is existing for the customer to receive the mobile from the seller A and for the customer to receive the SIM card from another party. So, there is no issue. Why? The customer can take the mobile from Dialog and the customer can get the SIM card from Mobitel. So, nobody can prevent the customer from receiving the mobile device from one party and two and receiving the service from another party. So, nobody can prevent. Now, what does it say? Since there is an already existing market for the customer to receive only the mobile from one party and to receive the services from another party, the customer can benefit only from the mobile on its own. Also, the customer can benefit only from the services on its own. Therefore, the mobile should be distinct from the services and the services should be distinct from the mobile. Accordingly, the mobile and the services are two enforceable promises for which 300,000 was received in common. So, without this 300,000 being taken to profit and loss as one single item of revenue, that should be broken down into two items of revenue. So, by identifying different performance obligations using the concept of being distinctiveness, what do we do? We try to identify how many revenue items to be recognized to profit and loss represented by a single amount of revenue. Now, let me take another simple example. There is a scientist and he invents a vaccine for COVID-19. And he gets the patent for this treatment. 
So, there is only one particular person under the sun who knows how to heal COVID-19 and he there is only one person who knows the technology of manufacturing or producing that vaccine and he is the person whom this patent has been given to. Now, the scientist without manufacturing or without making the vaccine in a commercial scale to the whole world, he thought of selling the patent and the technology, patent and the technology to a drug manufacturing company, so that the drug manufacturing company will take over the assignment of manufacturing the vaccine to the world in a commercial scale and there will be a royalty payment to the scientist. Now, I am look in the transaction from the viewpoint of the scientist, how the scientist should recognize performance obligations. What do you mean by performance obligations? Enforceable promises. How do we identify different enforceable promises? Being on the concept of distinctiveness. Let us look at it here. Scientists will be selling this vaccine or uh, the patent rather, patent and the technology to another party to a buyer at say 100 million US dollars. This 100 million US dollars consideration was received by the scientist just for one item of performance obligations of a two. Now, there are two items. Let us see whether these two can be separate performance obligations. The sale of the patent and the sale of the technology. Can the customer take only the patent from the scientist and to get the technology from someone else? Is there a separate market existing for the customer to buy the technology from someone else? No. Customer cannot buy the technology from someone else, but only from the scientist himself. Why nobody knows it? Similarly, can the customer buy the technology from the scientist and to buy the patent from someone else in the world? Is there a market where the customer can buy the patent from by receiving only the technology from the scientist? Not at all. Why no one else knows the technology, no one else has the patent. So, there is only one person who has the patent and the technology. So, if the customer buys the patent, he has to buy it only from one person. If the customer buys the technology as well, he has to buy it only from one person. So, as a result, customer does not benefit only from the patent because he cannot do anything only with the patent unless he takes, unless he buys the technology as well. Similarly, the customer cannot do anything only with the technology unless he gets the patent. And the customer does not benefit only from the patent, neither does the customer benefit only from the technology. For the customer to benefit, the customer has to buy the patent and the technology both from the same party. Why? There is no outside external market for the customer to buy the patent from the scientist and to buy the technology from someone else. Similarly, there is no external world, ex external market in the world for the customer to buy one item only from the scientist and to buy the other item from the world from the market in the world. So, as a result here, sale of the patent and the sale of the technology should be a single performance obligation. Why? Those two are distinct or are not distinct? Are not distinct. To understand the concept of distinctiveness, you will never look at the physical look, physical appearance. What do we check? What do we look at? Whether the customer can benefit on its goods, on goods and services on their own. You can check.
check a step number 1. I explain the first question, you can also go to the second question. Customer can use goods or service with other readily available resources. Now see, a construction company A enters into a contract with the customers to construct a runaway. And a vehicle park and a footbridge in an airport. Uh, this is constructed by connecting the vehicle park and the boarding areas. Now, this is for a single consideration of say 50 million US dollars. 50 million US dollars should be just a single item of revenue in the profit and loss, so should be broken down into three. That is based on the performance obligations. Performance obligations are based on distinctiveness. Distinctiveness are based on these questions to be raised. Step number one, let me go to the first question. I will explain first and second, I mean uh, there are two questions under step number one. Let me explain both of them now. Can the customer benefit from each of these constructions on their own? Yes. Why the customer can get this construction company to construct only the runaway and the customer can get the another party to construct the balance too? There is a market. Similarly, the customer can get this construction company to construct only the vehicle park and the customer can get another construction company to construct the balance to run away and the footbridge. Why there is a market? There are many people as many as you need who construct only the runaway, who construct only the vehicle park, who construct only the footbridge and if you want just one part to construct all of them together even that is possible. So, the customer benefit only from the runaway on its own, the customer benefits only from the vehicle park on its own, similarly the customer benefits only from the footbridge on its own. If you get the answer right from the very first question, you need not to go to the second, but for me to explain, let me proceed. Customer can use goods or services with other readily available resources. Just imagine the customer being a customer who has already the runaway in the airport and the airport is halfway constructed, halfway completed and it is only just that they want to get someone to construct the vehicle park. So, then the customer can benefit from the vehicle park along with the existing runaway. Just imagine the customer being a customer who has the runaway and the vehicle park both and the customer wants the construction company to construct only the footbridge. So, the customer can benefit the can benefit from the footbridge along with the existing runaway and the vehicle park. Now, Another simple example, a construction company or oh, let me take another one, a vehicle seller. sells a vehicle at 15 million rupees together with 5 free services. Now, for 15 million, just tell me one free service, if not you will be confused, one free service. So, apparently there are two promises, 
sale of the vehicle and providing a service for a common consideration of 15 million rupees. So, you need to see whether 15 million need to be divided between two promises or should be combined into a single item and they are purely based on the concept of distinctiveness. How do we identify distinctiveness based on this criteria? Step number one, first question, customer can benefit from the individual goods or services on its own. Can the customer benefit only from the vehicle without the customer receiving the service? Yes. I can buy the vehicle from one party and I can get the service from another party because we have a market as such. So, there are many suppliers who sell only the vehicles, there are many suppliers who provide only the vehicle services island wide. Then, second question step number one, customer can use goods or services with other readily available resources and if the customer has their own facility to get this vehicle service done, with the existing facility the customer can benefit only from the vehicle. And if the customer already has a vehicle and the customer has to get only the vehicle service done. So, the service can be the service that the seller is going to provide can be consumed with the existing vehicle or the vehicle that the seller is going to sell can be used with the existing service facility. I hope things are clear. So, as a result, the sale of the vehicle and the services to be provided free service should be distinct from each other and should be divided into two items of revenue. Now, let me take a contrasting example. A will manufacture a machine to a customer B. And this machine is highly customized to the exact requirements and specification of the customer B. And there is only one party, one particular manufacturers of this category of machines in the world and that is only A. And no one knows how to manufacture, how to service, how to repair, how to maintain, there is only one party under the sun who knows inside and out of the machine and he is the party who has invented the machine. Now, A receives 15 million rupees from B to manufacture the machine and to provide one free service, one free service. Like in my previous vehicle examples, you need to see whether seller is receiving 15 million rupees for one performance obligation or two performance obligations. So, that is purely based on what distinctiveness. So, you need to see whether the machine and the service are distinct from each other or not distinct. Do not ever look at the physical nature, you need to go by the criteria. Can the customer distinct I made a mistake. Can the customer benefit only from the machine without the customer receiving the services from the same supplier? Cannot. Why? The customer himself does not know how to repair, how to maintain, how to service. It is only the seller, it is only the manufacturer who knows how to do it ins and outs. The customer knows only to switch on and switch off and that is it. So, then the customer does not benefit only from the machine unless the customer gets the service, the, the maintenance services from the same supplier. Similarly, 
the customer does not benefit only from the services without receiving the asset. Why? Because there is no anyone else who manufactures and sells these kind of machines in the world. For the customer to benefit, he has to purchase the machine as well as the services from the same part. If not, customer will be in a problem. If the machine is broken, if the machine gets stuck, even the customer will be stuck. And if you go to the second, cost, you need not to go to the second if you are satisfied only with the first part. But let me explain. Customer can use goods or service with other readily available resources. What does it say? The customer needs only the machine because customer already knows how to maintain and how to service. Customer does not know. Why? There is only one party under the sun in the world who knows how to manufacture, who knows how to service. So, the customer does not have the knowledge of servicing and maintaining the asset. And if the customer buys the machine only from the seller, uh, the customer buys only the machine from the seller, because the customer has the knowledge of servicing, it is not possible because the customer does not know how to service. And on the other hand, customer will get only the knowledge of the servicing the asset because the customer has the asset. That is also not possible because the customer cannot have the asset already because there is only one person who knows how to construct the asset and how to maintain the asset. So, customer does not have readily available technology of maintaining already, neither does the customer have the asset already because there is only one party who provides the assets and the service technology. So, these two asset and the service are not distinct from each other and you need to combine both of them as one single performance obligation. So, this entire 15 million has to be recognized into one item of revenue. Then let us look at step number 2. Focus on whether the goods or service is distinct within the context of the contract. For that you need to raise three questions. Are the goods services integrated together to deliver an end product. So, you need to raise all the three questions together. Do the goods or services in the contract customize existing goods and services of the customer. Are the goods and services in the contract interdependent. So, you need to 
raise all the questions together to check out or uh, to evaluate step number 2. Focus on whether the goods or services, goods or services are distinct within the context of the contract. So, let me take examples for each. Are the goods or services integrated together to deliver an end product? Now, a construction company enters into a contract to construct a runaway, vehicle park and a footbridge in an airport and these three were taken under three performance obligations in our previous discussion. Now, there can be a difference the way the contract uh, agrees with the customer. The construction company says we will construct an airport which will include a runaway, which will include a vehicle park, which will include a footbridge as well. Now, the construction company being the seller does not promise to deliver a separate runaway, does not promise to deliver a separate footbridge and does not promise to deliver a separate vehicle park either. What does he promise to deliver? He promises to deliver a full airport which has to include the runaway and the vehicle park and the footbridge as ingredients. All these three constructions are to be integrated eventually to deliver an end product. So, what is the end product to be delivered? A airport. As a result, these three constructions are not considered to be distinct within the context of the contract and put it as one single performance obligations depending on the subsequent two questions are satisfied. Another one. A construction company enters into a contract to construct a 10 story building and the construction company promises to do the architectural plan, to do the physical construction, to do electrical wiring, to do plumbing and so on and so forth. If the construction company promises to deliver architectural plan separately to deliver, construction separately to deliver, electrical wiring separately to deliver, plumbing separately, there would have been how many performance obligations for why customer is benefited only from the architectural plan, he, because he can get the others done from someone else. Customer would have benefited only from the constructions of the building because he can get someone else to do the others. And the customer would have benefited only from electrical wiring because he can get someone else to do the others. He would have benefited only from the plumbing because he can get someone else to do the others. That is if you apply the first step, can the customer benefit only from each of these items on its own? Yes, because we have a market. But now coming to the second step, you will decide otherwise of having only one performance obligation because it is not just that the seller promises only to deliver architectural plans separately, it is not that the customer promising to deliver construction separately and the customer gets the entire building as the end product and he gets the construction completed in a sequence. What is the sequence? Sequence of doing the architectural plan and then the completing the constructions and then doing the plumbing, electrical wiring and so on and so forth. Here all these constructions will be integrated together to deliver the end product which is the final building. Here as a result the performance obligations are not distinct within the context of the contract and should be combined into a single item. Say a vendor, computer vendor 
promises to deliver 50 computers and then to build up a network to develop a network. If you apply the first step, there can be 51 performance obligation because the customer can buy just one computer from this seller concern and he can get the balance 49 from someone else. We have a market. Customer benefits only just one computer without receiving the balance because he can get the balance 49 from 49 suppliers and we have enough plenty suppliers of computers now in the market. Here the seller does not promise to deliver 50 computers separately and the development of a network separately. Instead, what does the seller promise? The seller promises to deliver a complete network, a complete IT solution, complete network to the customer. So, the entire 50 computers and the development of the network are not distinct within the context of the contract why all these 50 devices and the network services are to be integrated together to deliver an end product and these are not distinct within the context of the contract. Second one. Do the goods services in the contract customize existing goods or services of the customer? A seller is going to sell a software and this is say 50 million rupees. And then the seller himself realizes the fact that the existing computers of the customer do not interface to the new software. So, the seller has not only to provide the software also has to replace all the existing computers. What does it say? Since the existing computers of the customers do not interface to the new software, the seller of the software has to customize existing devices, existing computers of the customer and it is like the seller selling the software and the computers together and say the seller sells software plus 300 computers to the customer. It is not like the seller entering into a 301 performance obligation contract it is like the seller entering into a single performance obligation. Why? The computers and the software are not distinct within the context of the contract. Why? Because the goods that the seller sells in the contract customize existing goods of the customer. A seller sells a solar power panel to a customer and then the seller realizes the existing electrical wiring system does not support to the solar power panel. Then the seller himself had to rewire, redo the existing wiring systems completely from the beginning. Now, the seller sells the solar power panel, it is a product, it is an item together with the electrical wiring engineering service. Those two should be two separate performance obligations, so a single one. Here, it has to be a single one because the goods that the seller sells in the contract customize existing goods existing wiring system should be redone. Since the goods that the seller sells customize the existing goods, the sale of 
solar power panel and the services being provided are not distinct within the context of the contract, why the goods that the seller sells in the contract customize the existing goods. Last one, are the goods services in the contract interdependent? Now, let me take the same examples I took before. A scientist who invented a permanent vaccine for COVID-19 sells the patent and the technology to another party. And the patent and the technology were considered to have been a single performance obligations in our step number evaluation. We will apply the step number 2 as well. Why? Before you arrive at the final conclusions, you need to evaluate step number 1, step number 2 both. If you get the answers halfway through, please you need not to stop there, you need to run through each and every step with each and every single question before you arrive at the final conclusion. Now, the patent and the technology are interdependent. Why the customer cannot use only the technology without the patent? Similarly, the customer cannot use only the patent without the technology. These two are interdependent. Also, the customer cannot use the technology with another patent. Similarly, the customer cannot use the patent without, with another technology. So, these two are interdependent. So, then once again, the patent and the technology are not distinct within the context of the contract. Just one more example. A construction company enters into a contract to construct a telecommunication tower to a customer, also agreed contracted to manufacture a device used to check whether the tower disseminates signals properly. So, without having that device, you cannot check whether the towers are disseminating the signals properly. Now, the tower was constructed and without having this device, the customer cannot make use of the tower because we cannot technically check whether the tower is disseminating signals without making use of the device. Similarly, the customer cannot make use of the device without the construction company giving the tower. Why the device cannot be used with anyone else and the tower cannot be used with any other devices. These two are interconnected the device and the tower are interconnected, interdependent. So, these two are not distinct within the context of the contract and as a result put them as a single performance obligation. So, this is method 1 and there were two steps and under method 1, before you arrive at the final conclusions, you need to check both steps at the same time. Let me go to method 2.
is they are a series of distinct goods or services that are substantially the same with the same pattern of trans those are very important so there has to be a series couple of goods or services connected to a chain like a C I mean that is how it becomes a series and those goods and services should be substantially the same and then you need to look at the physical nature but they are distinct you need to apply the previous criteria to check the distinctiveness pattern of transfer should also be the same so let me come to a small example company a is a janitor and they provide cleaning services a enters into a contract with company b to provide cleaning services over three years time and the services are provided on weekly basis on every friday the services have to be provided end of the office hours now weekly services so there are 52 services a year into 3 years it will be all together 156 services throughout the contractual period a series substantially the same now the office space does not keep expanding no the the dimensions of the office and the circumference the width and the breadth of the building will remain the same over three years time so the nature of the service to be provided does not go varying from week to week the same service the services are substantially the same and the amount of materials to be consumed and the number of hours to be spent for a service does not go varying from service to service. The services to be provided are substantially the same. But they are distinct. Why? Customer can get the very first service from us and the customer can get the balance 155 services from another party. So there are plenty of service providers providers of this nature janitor services or the customer can get 155 services from us and he can get the very last service from another party many suppliers are there in the market so we have a market to get the services they are distinct customer can benefit only from first service without receiving the balance 155 customer can benefit from 155 services without receiving the last one because the customer can get the services enough from many suppliers in the market so all the services are distinct but they are physically substantially the same same pattern of transfer how do we transfer the service always weekly and then if the answer is yes, is there are a series of services? Yes. Are they distinct? Yes. Are they substantially the same? Yes. Is the pattern of transfer the same? Yes. Then put all of them together as a single performance obligation. So despite the fact that there are 156 services to be provided, put all of them together as a single performance obligation. A catering company enters into a contract with Sri Lankan Airlines to provide 100 food packets weekly over three years period. 100 food packets a week into 52 
into 3 years and then you can calculate the number of food packets to be delivered. Each food packet has to be with the standard quantity and a menu. There should be a cup full of rice, there should be a yogurt cup full of gravy, there should be a chicken piece with a standard size and there has to be a salad that is the menu. The quantity should be the same and it has to be a weekly transfer. Now, the services of the goods to be provided, there is a series weekly you need to transfer the goods. Now, you will look at the criteria. Is there a series? Yes. Are they distinct from each other? Yes. The customer can receive 100 food packets from us for the first week and for the rest of the period the customer gets someone else to supply the food packets. Why? We have enough supplies in the market. So, the customer benefits only from the first delivery and the customer can get the, the rest of the deliveries from another party. Similarly, the customer can get us to deliver 155 times he can benefit only from 155 and to get the last from from another part. What I am trying to say is there are many catering companies who can provide as many food packets as you need from the market. We can uh, get many supplies in the market. Now, the goods that the seller supplies are distinct from each other and there is a series of goods to be provided and the goods to be provided are substantially the same, same pattern of transfer as a result you need to combine all of them together into a single performance obligation why you apply the second method all the requirements in the second method are satisfied. Just one more example before we wind up with the performance obligation matter. Company A is an accounting firm. They provide accounting services on salary calculations and payment to salaries to a client over 3 years time. Salary date is on 25th of each month and we will make a simple assumption what is it? The number of employees in this company over 3 years time will be the same, no salary revisions, no additional taxes being levied. So, the services are on monthly basis, 12 into 3, there are how many services? 36 services, we will apply the second method. Is there a series of services? Yes. Are they distinct? Yes, they are distinct. Why? Customer can benefit only from the first service from us and he can get the second 35 from another accounting firm. Many firms are there who provide the accounting services required. Services are distinct. Are they substantially the same? Yes, why? The number of employees are assumed to be the same over 3 years time, calculations are the same, so the services are substantially the same. Same pattern of transfer, yes, why? We do the services exactly on 25th of each month, same pattern of transfer. That was not the last and let me take you the to the last example. So, here the services of 36 are considered to be a single performance obligation. Why? There is a series of distinct services that are substantially the same with the same pattern of transfer. Company A sells motor vehicles. A sells a motor vehicle at 15 million rupees with 5 free services. Now, we will forget about the sale of the vehicle for the time being. Since there are 5 services to be provided freely, let us apply the second method to realize whether 5 services should be a single performance obligation or 5 performance obligations. 
Now, the services to be provided can be distinct. Why? The customer can get one service from us and the customer can get the balance flow from another party. They are distinct. Then, the services should be substantially the same. The amount of materials and the duration or the time spent for each service will be the same from service to service or will be different from the service to service. The materials consumed for the first service will not be the materials to be consumed for the second service. The older the vehicle, the more the amount of materials to be consumed for the services. The older the vehicle, the longer the time needed to complete the service. So, the material consumptions and the time to be spent will be different from service to service. So, they are not substantially the same. Pattern of trans also will be the will not be the same. The customer will get the service first one within one month's time from the date of the sale and the customer will get the second service in six months time and the customer will get the third service in another three months time. So, there is no regularity of providing the service as such and the pattern of the transfer of the service will be different. So, the second method does not apply. So, each service has to be a different performance obligation the five services cannot be combined into a single one. We will move on to third criteria determining the transaction price. So, we are moving on to third step in our five step model discussion determining the transaction price. <coughs> transaction price is the amount of consideration to which an entity expects to be entitled in exchange for transferring promised goods or services to a customer, excluding amounts collected on behalf of third parties. Transaction price reflects the effects of the following fixed consideration, variable considerations, including applications of the constraints, significant finance component, non cash considerations, consideration paid or payable to a customer. So, without going into detailed discussions as to what these each uh, I mean uh, doing calculations with uh, each of these elements, let me explain briefly as to what each and every item is. Fixed consideration. Now, that will be the consideration agreed with the customer once and for all without changing it based on other criteria. Say for a small example, construction company enters into a contract with a customer which takes altogether 5 years to complete and the price agreed between the parties once and for all is 500 million. So, this is what you call the fixed consideration. Say another simple example A promises to sell a computer at 50,000, but the seller offers a special discount scheme to a customer. Look, if the number of computers to be purchased a year will be 50, the price will be 50,000. And if the number exceeds 50 and if it is in between 50 to 100, retrospectively the prices will be 45,000. 
what I am saying is, if the seller sells a computer at 50,000 rupees, that is the price to be effective for the first 50. And if the customer purchases the 51st computer as well, then the selling price will not be 50,000. That becomes 45,000, not from the 51st computer onwards, right from the very beginning. Then even for the first 50, prices will be adjusted retrospectively up to 45,000. So, we will forget about the price being 45 subsequently and this price agreed at the beginning 50,000 is called the fixed consideration. Then variable consideration. Part of the consideration agreed with the customer will change based on criteria. Now, let me take the same example. The customer and the construction company agrees for a particular construction at 500 million rupees. And that takes altogether 5 years to complete. The customer says, in case you manage to complete the whole construction just within 5 years time, we will pay you another 10 million rupees as an incentive. So, whether the seller becomes entitled to this 10 million rupees or not depends on whether the seller can complete the construction within the 5 years period or not. So, that is realizable and its realization is contingent on, it is not a contingent consideration as such, it is called a variable consideration and its realizations will depend on whether they can complete the construction within the stipulated 5 years period. So, it is called the variable consideration. And the second example I took selling price of a computer is 50,000 and this is effective for the first 50. If the customer places orders beyond 50 computers, then the prices will be ret retrospectively adjusted to 45,000. As the customer places the order for the 51st computer, the prices for the 50 computers sold already will get adjusted not to 50, will get adjusted to 45. So, that subsequent discounts being offered depends on the volume of the purchases of the customer. So, that is called the variable consideration. And let me take the same example I took before. The construction with the customer that takes 5 years will stipulate that the customer is going to pay another 20 million rupees incentive payment to the construction company. If the construction company can perform the job at the expected level of standards and expectations of the customer. So, whether the selling company entitles to this 20 million bonus or not depends on whether, they get, whether the construction company can meet the required specification standard of the customer. So, the second, I mean this 20 million incentive payment is also part of what variable consideration. Significant financing component. Now, a seller sells some goods at 1 million rupees on 1st January 19.
the seller receives the consideration then and there. He sells the goods and instantaneously he collects the consideration. So then there is no need for the seller to charge something excess additional apart from the value of the goods sold and that is it. Now the seller sells goods on 1st January 19 at 1 million rupees and both parties agree for the settlement in one year's time on 31st December 19. And you know receiving 1 million rupees right now is better than you receiving 1 million rupees in one year's time. Receiving 1 million rupees in one year's time is less worth than you receiving 1 million rupees right now. So, what makes 1 million rupees in one, one year's time worth less than 1 million rupees right now? Three reasons. What are those three reasons? Opportunity cost. If the seller receives 1 million rupees right now, he can make that 1 million rupee in an another investment. Just imagine the seller receiving 5 percent income for the investment. The seller will be losing that opportunity of earning 5 percent extra income for receiving the payment not right now, but receiving the payment in one year's time. So, there is an opportunity cost and inflation. If the inflation is considered to be three, uh, 2 percent, for you to buy 1 million rupees worth of goods as of today, in one year's time you need 1 million 2000. So, this 2 percent existing inflation will reduce your purchasing power over the period. And third, the risk. If you receive 1 million rupees right now, that is less risky. And if you get it in one year's time, that becomes more risky. The longer the customer takes to settle, the higher the risk is. So, the seller has to charge something extra for the additional risk that the seller takes over for agreeing to collect it in, in one year's time. So, as a result, if the seller sells the goods right now and agrees to collect it later in one year's time, in addition to receiving the value of the goods sold and the value of the services rendered, the seller will decide to charge something for the opportunity cost, will decide to charge something more for the uh, inflations, will decide to charge something for the risk and will put all these three components together and call it interest. So, then the seller in addition to receiving the value of the goods and the services also will decide to receive something extra we call it interest, but here we will use a different terminology. Instead of calling that interest, we will call it significant finance component, significant finance component. So, there is a significant finance component also involved in the transaction price. Non-cash consideration. Now, the seller 
transfers goods or services to the customer in exchange of a consideration which is other than in cash. Say for an example, the seller will sell goods to the customer, goods and the customer instead of making the payment in cash, makes the settlement by issuing the shares of the customer. So, the seller transfers the goods or services to the customer in exchange of equity items of the customer. So, that is where the non-cash considerations comes into play. Last one, consideration paid or payable to a customer. While the seller entering into a sale contract with the customer, simultaneously the seller enters into another contract with the same customer to receive another reciprocative service. Say for a small example, seller will be consigning 10,000 items of goods of the seller for sale of the customer. At the same time, the seller will be sending 100 units of the goods of the seller asking the customer to asking the customer to display in the showroom of the customer. So, there are two transactions that are synchronizing together. Seller sending 10,000 items of goods to the customer for sale, <coughs> at the same time sending 100 items of goods of the seller to the customer not for sale, but to exhibiting those goods in the showroom of the customer. And then from the consideration that the seller receives for 10,000 items of sale, seller has to pay something to the customer for the services that the seller receives from the customer. So, let us take each and every single one of them with elaborative examples and illustrations. So, I will take you through each and every item in our discussion now. So, let me start from the last one. <coughs> Consideration paid or payable to a customer. A consigns goods to a customer of 10,000 items at 100 rupees per unit. A also sends 100 items for the customer to exhibit in the showrooms of the customer. the fair value of the service from the customer in a standalone transaction is Twenty 
25,000 rupees. Let me make it 100,000. The customer agrees to settle rupees. 850,000. Right. I am just taking the easiest first. Easiest one is the last item. Consideration paid or payable to a customer. A consigns goods to a customer of 10,000 items at 100 rupees per unit. A also sends 100 items for the customer to exhibit in the showrooms of the customer. The fair value of the services from the customer in a standalone transaction is 100,000. The customer agrees to settle rupees 850,000. We'll open up sales account and debtors account. Originally, as the goods are dispatched to the customer, how much of revenue can you recognize with debit to debtors by 1 million rupees and credit to sales by 1 million rupees? Now, <coughs> another transaction occurs together with the sale transaction. What is it? The seller receiving a service of getting his goods exhibited in the showrooms of the customer at the same time. These two transactions are synchronizing, happening at the same time. Just imagine the seller enters into the service transaction from the customer without sending the sales goods to the customer, then the service transaction would have been a standalone transaction. If the transaction of receiving the service from the customer was standalone, what would have been the market value of that transaction? That would have been 100,000. Then, customer does not pay this entire 1 million rupees of the value of the goods sold to the customer because the customer is, customer is keeping, retaining 100,000 rupees 100,000 rupees for the value of the service he provides. So, then you credit debtors and debit pair, debit to an expenditure or profit and loss. What is it? The value of the service that the seller takes it from the customer. So, the balance that the customer should remit should be what? Should be 900,000. But then, does the seller receive that 900,000? The seller does not receive that 900,000 rupees either. He gets only 850,000. So, what is the balance 50,000 deduction for? And that is not explained in the question. So, where the explanations is not given, it is reasonably assumed to be a discount which the seller has offered to the customer. It is considered to be a trade discount. Then you credit to debtors by 50,000 rupees and debit to sales. Trade discounts can be debited to sales account 50,000. Eventually, how much of a revenue should be recognized by the seller for the sale of goods that should be 950,000? So, that is for the last item which I explained first, consideration paid or payable to the customer. <coughs> then non-cash consideration. APLC enters into a contract with a customer B to sell the 
sell some goods. Sells goods. <coughs> then the value of the goods sold to the customer is not settled in cash. It is settled by the customer by issuing the equity shares of the customer to the seller. Then it is like the company A, the seller making an investment in the shares of company B by transferring the goods to company B. So, there are two aspects to be looked at recognizing the investment in shares of company B, also recognizing the revenue. Let us look at in our future calculations which fair value of the transaction should be used in doing the accounting, whether it should be the fair values of equity items of the customer that is to be recognized or whether it is the fair value of the goods sold to the customer that should be recognized as the value of the transaction. Significant finance component, I just wanted to come to that point quickly and that is very important. Significant finance component. So, what do you mean by a significant finance component including an interest in the transaction price? What is interest comprising with? That is comprising with three elements. What are these three? Opportunity cost and inflation and the credit risk. You can further summarize opportunity cost and the inflation can be combined together and you can call it the time value of money. And then time value of money plus credit risk will form interest together. Now, not that all the, not that do all the transactions include a significant finance component just because you decide to collect that in the future. Just because you decide to defer the receipt of the consideration, it does not mean that all the transactions will include a significant financing component. For the transaction price to include a significant finance component, please remember there has to be a hidden finance arrangement. How do we, you know, separately identify whether it is including a significant finance component or not? It is not that hard. First, you need to satisfy yourself the reason why you defer the receipt of the consideration to the future is because there is an implicit hidden finance arrangement. If you decide to defer the receipt of the consideration to the future for a reason other than you providing a hidden finance arrangement, please note that there is no a significant finance component. Now, let me take two contrasting examples. A. Sells goods today at 1 million. And the transaction date 1st January 19, you collect it today itself. So, no issue. 
if you sell the goods today on 1st January 19 and decide to collect from the customer in one year's time, come on, that is like you selling the goods to the customer right now and receiving the full consideration right now from the customer and giving that 1 million rupees back to the customer as a loan expecting the customer to pay you that in one year's time. So, how many transactions are there? Two transactions. What are those two? The seller selling the goods right now and receiving that in one year's time is like you dividing the transactions into two, how do you divide it? It is like the seller selling the goods at 1 million rupees and collecting the full amount right now and then giving that 1 million rupees back to the customer, expecting the customer to pay you 1 million rupees in one year's time with interest. Now, without the examiner, Detailing the explanations to that extent, the examiner might say the seller sold goods at 1 million rupees and agreed to collect that in one year's time at 1.1 million rupees. The examiner himself does not explain in the question that there is another finance arrangement and you should be wise without being otherwise to understand the fact that there were two transactions of selling goods right now and collecting the consideration right now and granting 1 million rupees as a loan back to the customer expecting the customer to give it in one year's time. And that is what you study the webinar, you, you are watching the webinar for to understand that logic. Then <coughs> Here, the reason why the seller defers the receipt of consideration is because the seller is providing a hidden finance arrangement to the customer. So, there is a hidden finance component. Now, let me take a contrasting one. Company A enters into a contract to construct a building at 500 million rupees and this is to be completed in within 5 years time. As agreed, A completed the constructions in 5 years time and handed over the construction to the customer. The way the construction company and the customer agreed is that the customer is going to retain 10 percent of the total consideration of the contract price over two years time and the customer will release that 10 percent of the consideration total consideration in two years time from the date of the completion of the construction. After satisfying the customer that the construction is up to the mark and to the standard and no technical defects were ever detected within two years subsequent period. So, of this 500 million total value, 50 million will be deferred to the future over two years time and are we thinking the way we thought it before, what are we thinking? 50 million will be received in two years time, does that also include a significant finance component just because we deferred the receipt of the consideration over two years? No, why? The seller decides to defer that payment to the future is because the seller is giving an implicit hidden finance arrangement or it is deferred to the future for a reason other than providing a finance arrangement. The payment or the receipt of the consideration was deferred to the future for a reason other than a finance arrangement and that does not include a significant finance component.
then let us work out a simple example. A sells goods on 1st January 2019 and decides to receive the consideration over 5 equal annual installments at the end of each year. The value of a consideration, value of an installment S rupees 2637975.48 explain the revenue recognition We need to apply 5 step model, there has to be a contract, you need to identify the performance obligations and then determine in the transaction price. Now the value of the goods sold is not given, but instead the amount to be received from the customer is given 263797. Let me forget about the decimals for the sim uh, convenience into 5 installments. So, how much will it will it be? 1, 3, 1,318,985. Is it the amount to be taken to revenue? It is not. Why? The reason why the seller defers the receipt of the considerations over 5 years is because there is an untold finance arrangement to the customer. Implicitly a finance arrangement has been provided. So, this amount to be received over 5 years time is including not only the value of the goods sold, also the significant finance component in other words interest. So, interest is a separate item of revenue to be recognized that is based on SLFRS 9 and to recognize revenue under SLFRS 15 you need to determine the value of the goods sold. How? This is including the value of the goods sold plus the significant finance component. If you eliminate the significant finance component, then you can determine the value of the goods sold. Then you need to discount 263797. One point I have not given the interest rate, say interest rate is 10 percent, 10 percent annual interest rate. plus 263797 divided by 1.1 to the power 2 and it continues over 5 years time. And for students at your age and level, this calculation looks too, too simple and childish. And without having these lengthy calculations and you can't even afford to lose time to solve it, we can straight away apply annuity factor and take it 1 minus 
1.1 to the power minus 5 divided by 0 0.1 into 263797.48 will give you the present value that is 1 million exactly you can work it out. So, though you are to receive 1,380,985, that is not the final total amount of revenue to be recognized. How much of revenue to be recognized? 1 million, then you credit revenue by 1 million rupees and debit debtors by 1 million rupees. And SLFR is 15 stops applying to this transaction at this point. And hereafter you can apply SLFR is 9 for you to recognize revenue. For you to recognize revenue of interest, which method do we apply? Effective interest method. Then effective interest rate has to be equal to 10 percent interest here. You recognize effective interest of 100,000 here and that goes to profit and loss. Remember interest is recognized not based on SLFR is 15 based on SLFR is 9 using effective interest method. For debtors which method do we apply effect uh, amortized cost recognize effective and then Interim payments are there, debit cash and credit to debtors 263797. The balancing figure has to be the amortized cost. So, there were two transactions recognizing revenue for which SLFR is 15 applies and recognizing interest revenue, interest income for which SLFR is 9 applies. How do we decide the interest rate? And you can't apply any rate as the interest rate in deciding the significant finance component. In deciding the significant finance component, you need to decide interest rate. As you decide the interest rate, that has to be decided in such a way that the credit characteristics of the customer are demonstrated. And you must make sure that SLFR is 15 requires us to decide the interest rate of the contract in such a way that the credit characteristics of the customers are demonstrated. Now, say for a small example, a customer enters into a contract with a seller to purchase 1 million worth of goods. So, the seller gives offers two options to the customer. Either the customer can make the full payment right now, but the goods will be delivered in two years time, the customer agrees. Anyway, the customer wants to buy goods in two years time. Customer has two options been given, either the customer can make the full payment right now and receive the goods in two years time or the customer can make the full payment of 1.6 million rupees in two years time at the time of the goods being delivered. So, what does it imply? It is like the customer being charged 600,000 rupees interest over two years time. You can take that 600,000 rupees as significant finance component if you have decided it based on an interest rate that reflects 
the credit characteristics of the customer. How will you decide the credit characteristics? You need to take time value of money plus you need to adjust the credit risk of the customer and then the finance, I mean interest rate can be decided. If this interest of 600,000 has been decided, has not been decided in such a way the credit characteristics of the customers are demonstrated, remember you cannot use 600,000 rupees as the significant finance component and you need to decide the rate separately and that is that rate you should apply for the calculations and let us see how the interest rate is decided.